All right, before we turn to the Word of God, would you join me as we talk again to the God of the Word? Almighty God, we come to you as needy people. We're humbled by our sins, we're desperate for your blessing in our lives, in our community, and our church. We need a word from you today to bring comfort, to bring healing and cleansing to our hearts. Please meet with us. Please speak to us. Help us to see Jesus, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever been in an earthquake? Oh, yes. We have had a few here in Virginia, haven't we? Yeah. Earthquakes are frightening. Uh, they have a way of getting our attention. First, you're not sure what's going on, but all of a sudden it's like, oh, better run outside. Well, today I want to go back and visit the epicenter of a powerful earthquake of a different kind in the pages of God's Word. You know, I've been a pastor for, for oh gosh, 47 years, something like that. It's been a long time. <laughs> and the longer I serve the Lord, the more I am convinced of this truth. If the church is going to make a difference for God in the 21st century, we've got to go back and learn from the church in the 1st century. If the church is going to make a difference for God, do you want to make a difference for God? I do. Then I think we need to go back and keep learning from the early church. In Acts chapter 4, we find God's exciting new mystery called the church. And you remember we've talked about this mystery before. It was that Jews and Gentiles could be together in some new thing. It was an amazing thing, a mystery. By the time we read about it in, in uh, Acts 4, the church in Jerusalem had grown from just about 120 to more than 20,000 people in just a few weeks. Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't it be great if God would do that again here all across America? Wouldn't that be fantastic? So how can this church accomplish the mission that Jesus left for us? And what's the mission? He said, you'll be my what? Witnesses. How can we accomplish this mission? And God gives us the answer in his word. And that involves following the principles laid out in the book of Acts. And one of those principles is that of powerful prayer. Not, not just any prayer, but prayer that has the right perspective. So let's look at the powerful prayer that rocked the church like an, early, like an earthquake in the, in the book of Acts. So let's go back and pick up the story, okay? In Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, God uses Peter and John to heal a lame man in the temple. Now, you've got to remember, back then there weren't hospitals, there weren't the medical technology and the medicines and the doctors we have now. So if a lame man gets healed, and he's at the temple all the time, and people, that's a big deal, okay? That's a big deal. So when the people saw this lame man walking and jumping and praising God, they were amazed, and they gathered around. A big crowd gathers around Peter and John. And Peter preached Jesus to them, and the Bible says that 5,000 people, probably just to count the men, were added to the church in one day. So it might have been more than that, but at least 5,000 added in one day. Meanwhile, the priests and the Sadducees have the temple guards grab Peter and John and throw them into prison. So listen now to Acts chapter 4, verse 8 and following. When they brought Peter and John before the Sanhedrin the next day, the Bible says this. Then Peter, verse 8, Acts 4, verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that these were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Well, then they got together in verse 16. They said this, what are we going to do with these men? Everybody living in Jerusalem knows that they've done an outstanding miracle. We can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Now, of course, they couldn't ban them from Facebook and Twitter, which they would have if they could have. <laughs> but this is what they did. Well, let's get them together and say, don't speak anymore in this name, in this man's name. So now remember, this is a powerful group, okay? These are the same men that arranged for the crucifixion of Jesus. All right, verse 19. 
But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we can't help speaking about what we've seen and heard. Well, after Peter and John were released, they went straight back to the church and told them about how they had been threatened in verse 23. And verse 24 of Acts 4 records that the first thing they did was file a lawsuit? No. The first thing they did, the Bible says they lifted their voices to God and prayed. In prayer. The church got together and prayed. Folks, the New Testament church was a praying church. That's why it was a powerful church. The modern church in America is not so much a praying church anymore. And that's why it's often weak and defeated. Have you heard what's going on in Canada where they're going around burning churches? Blaming them for the sins of the, of the past long ago? Yeah, we, we don't live in, a, in an age that's very friendly to churches anymore. At one time, most churches had a midweek service. Do you remember what the midweek service was called? That's right, it was called prayer meeting, wasn't it? It was called prayer meeting. What happened? Why, why don't churches have prayer meetings anymore? People stopped coming. People stopped coming. I've, I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating. My father uh, pastored a little church out in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey called Landmark Baptist Church. And they would have a Bible study and people would come. They would even take notes, you know. Nothing much was happening. My dad said, you know what? We had, they, at that church, they had Sunday school, Sunday morning worship, Sunday evening service, and then Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study. He says, we have a lot of Bible teaching going on. He said, we need to pray more. So he said, from now on, we're going to pray. You bring a notepad and a pencil. We're going to write down our prayer request. We're going to pray for them. We're not going to have a Bible study Wednesday night because we have three times on Sunday that you can study the Bible. Interesting. And you know what? The meeting grew in size as people saw God answering prayer because they would write down when the prayers were answered. Folks, listen, when we organize, we get what people can do. But when we pray, we get what God can do. Think about that. When we organize, and we're good at organizing, aren't we? Brethren are really good at organizing. We, we are great at organizing. We have all kinds of things to help needy people. And, but when we pray, we get what God can do. I don't know about you. I want God to do something. The church is not just a human organization, right? We need God to work. It's a spiritual thing. And I want to challenge you today. Do you pray? Most people would say they pray. When, when do you pray? Do you pray and when do you pray? Uh, when do we get together and pray with other Christians? Because you remember the Bible says when just two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, he's there with them. And if two or three of you agree about anything on earth, what? It'll be done in him. He said it'll be done. So praying together with other Christians is important. All right, think about this. How does your prayer time compare to your TV time? Or today I have to ask about Facebook time or Instagram or TikTok. That's the thing young people are really into. They just spend hours watching these things, you know. It's easy to get drawn in. Spend lots of time. How does it come, how's your prayer time compare to that? What controls your life, Hollywood or the Holy Spirit? I've heard people say, oh, I've got to go now. It's time for my show. <laughs> What if everybody in the church prayed like you and I pray? Would there be revival in the church? Or would the light of the gospel go out? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud with you. I'm not accusing anyone. Folks, God's power is unleashed when we pray. And his power is prevented when we don't. The Bible records what happened when the people prayed. In verses 31 to 33... Of Acts 4. The Bible says after praying, it says the place where they were meeting was shaken. It was a church quake, okay? New term there. They were filled, second of all, with the Holy Spirit. They were of one heart and mind. There was unity in the church. Wow, that's something to speak about in America, isn't it? Unity in the church. And the apostles testified boldly with great power to the resurrection of Jesus. And look at the last one. It says, in much grace great grace, favor in the original Greek was upon them upon them all. I call that the X factor of church growth remember X if you did algebra was the unknown quantity right 
What's the unknown quantity church? You, you can't make it happen. As I said earlier, the church is not a business. Okay? And some people treat churches, well, if you do this, this, and this, then you'll have these results. If we organize, we get what men and women can do. But if we pray, we get what God can do. And God's favor is the unknown quantity. It's what we need to see church growth, to see people come to Christ, to see communities transform. You know, I, I hear these news reports about crime is on the increase. In America, murders are up. And people are doing all kinds of crazy things, aren't they? What's the solution? Well, some people say it's more police. Some people say it's more gun laws. The solution is people's hearts need to be changed so they don't want to go do those things anymore. And as far as I know, God's the only one who can change people's want to. He's the only one. He changed mine. Much grace was upon them. They testified boldly. They had unity. They were filled with the Spirit. Wouldn't you like that to be said about this church? (laughs) That would be awesome. That would be awesome. Well, it could be if we follow the principles in this prayer. So let's see what made this prayer so powerful that God said, Amen, by rocking the church house, okay? So first of all, what we'll discover is that we need to pray like they did, okay? And I want you to notice the perspective of their prayer. The perspective of powerful prayer. If we want to pray with power, if we want God's presence, if we want Him to rock the church house, we need to pray with the right perspective, Well, a proper perspective means that we have the right point of view. A correct understanding of the facts. Look at verse 24, if you have your Bible open. Acts 4, verse 24, it says, When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. I think I have it up here. Okay, good. It said, Sovereign Lord, they said, You made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and your will had decided beforehand what should happen. So what is a proper perspective of God? Well, first of all, they saw God as the almighty creator. They said, you knew the high priest and the 70 members of the Sanhedrin have power, but Lord, you are creator. You made them and you have almighty power. You have power over them. And so the church prayed, Lord, the people who threatened us are creatures, but you're the creator. Lord, we're not worried because you made it all. You made it, you're in charge. They looked beyond the visible to the invisible. They looked beyond the power of their opponents, to the power of the omnipotent God. What does omnipotent mean? All-powerful. All-powerful. We need to get our eyes off of opponents and get our eyes back on God. Do you realize that we serve the God who created heaven and earth? He made it all. The Bible says He weighs the mountains in the scale. It says He holds the seven seas in His hands. You remember He divided the sea for Moses. That was no problem. He's the God who brought down the walls of Jericho. He delivered Goliath into the hands of David and the three Hebrew children out of the fiery furnace. He's the God who came in human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, commanded the winds and the waves, who cast out demons, who raised the dead. That's our God, okay? He's the God that's the judge at the end of the age, the God of might and majesty, of power and great glory. He's a living God and beside him, the Bible says there is no other. Secondly, they not only saw God as the Almighty Creator, but they saw Him as the absolute sovereign Lord. God didn't just create the universe, wind it up, throw it out, and let it spin. You know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. He's in charge. He calls the shots in the world. That's what our founding fathers called divine providence. And I don't know if you remember this part of history, but this really struck me. When they were gathered together with that painting depicts at the Constitutional Convention, and they hit impasse after impasse, and they were ready to give up, some were leaving and going home, Ben Franklin said, you know what? We have forgotten God. We need to pray. And they called one of the ministers, a lot of them there were ministers, to lead in prayer. He read from the Psalms. They prayed. People were in tears. They spent several days praying. When they came back, got back together, there was a unity like never before. And they produced one of the most amazing doctrine, documents in the history of the world. 
Okay? He's a sovereign Lord. He's divine providence. And in verses 25 to 28, the early church prayed from Psalm chapter 2. And they're saying, Lord, this is a direct fulfillment of the prophecies that you made. You said the nations would rage. You said that people would plot and the kings and rulers of the earth would rise up against you and your son. Lord, it happened just like you said it would. They did what your power and your will decided beforehand should happen. But they said, Lord, you're not only the creator, you're also the absolute sovereign. In fact, the way they address God demonstrates that perspective. In verse 24, the NIV says, sovereign Lord. King James says, Lord. The Greek word there means a despot. What's a despot? It's a ruler with absolute power. In other words, God's in charge. God's still in charge, isn't he? Doesn't matter what people do. God's still in charge. So here's what the church did. They gathered together to pray in the midst of a clear and present danger. And they looked back to the darkest day of their lives. They remembered the day when all their hopes and dreams were nailed to a cross and they thought all is lost. Have you ever felt like that? All is lost. But then they saw Jesus Christ defeat death and walk out of the tomb alive just as he promised. Just as he promised. They watched him ascend on the clouds into heaven just as he promised. And they experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in their lives just as he promised. Folks, when God makes a promise, you can count on that. As they say, you can take that to the bank, right? Because God keeps his promises. And they knew that everything was proceeding according to the plans and purposes of a sovereign God. It was exactly, precisely what God had mapped out before the foundation of the world. Do you remember Corrie Ten Boom? She suffered at Hitler's concentration camp. She lost family members and yet was a shining testimony for Christ. And she once said, there is no panic in heaven, only plans. Things catch us by surprise all the time, don't they? But we have to remind ourselves, God isn't panicked. He has plans. He's working his plans out. Just let that sink in. Pastor Adrian Rogers used to say, the Holy Trinity never meets in an emergency session. The Holy Trinity never has to meet in an emergency session. Think about that. His plans are being accomplished. When John was given the revelation of Jesus Christ, he saw heaven opened, and the first thing that impressed him was that God was seated on the throne. He was seated on the throne. What does that mean? It means that everything was under control. When a king stood up, that means there was problems he needed to address. But God was seated on the throne, everything under control. Folks, our God has everything well in hand. Amen? Amen. Everything well in hand. And that perspective makes a difference in how we handle problems. It helps us to learn to glance at our problems and to turn our gaze to our great God who was the almighty creator and the absolute sovereign of the universe. Let me tell you, you'll pray a prayer that rocks the church when you pray to that God. The only true prayer answering God. And I love to, I love to go over that with people. Why does prayer work? Can you tell me why prayer works? It's because we have a prayer answering God. Doesn't matter how sincere you are if there was nobody at the other end, right? We have a prayer answering God who is the sovereign ruler and creator of the universe, folks. So in their prayer, they had a proper perspective of God. But they also had a proper perspective of themselves. In verse 29, they call themselves servants. The word for servants literally means a bond slave. They were saying, Lord, grant to your slaves, your bond slaves, that we might speak your word with boldness. Folks, I believe that the reason... Many prayers are unanswered is because we often don't have this perspective. Many people still act, many Christians still act as if they control their world. They're in charge. You know, God is just for emergencies, right? Yeah. Every now and then I'll see a bumper sticker. I used to see more of these. You don't see as many. But do you remember this bumper sticker? It says, God is my what? Co-pilot. co-pilot. You remember seeing those? God is my co-pilot. Newsflash. No, he's not. <laughs> he's not. A businessman once said, I'm going to start a business and I've asked God to be my partner. And then he promptly went bankrupt. (laughs) Okay. 
Friends, God doesn't want to be your partner or co-pilot. He is your L-O-R-D, okay? He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You're his servant. He's our sovereign. He calls the shots. He makes the decisions. He says, go. And what do we do? Go. He says, come. And what do we do? We come. As the Apostle Paul said, he said, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the form, the nature of what? A servant. The word means bond slave. Same word. Do we want God to answer our prayers? Do we want to see God bring revival and a true spiritual awakening to the church? Do we want to see Him move with power? Do we? If so, we need to get the right perspective of God in ourselves. We need to submit ourselves to Jesus Christ as our sovereign Lord. There's no better way to do it than to get on our knees before the Lord and cry out to Him like the early church did. Friends, we need to pray. We need a prayer revival, a revival of prayer in the church. We've had enough of programs and in the amazing technologies and all the things that we do. We need God to work. Some may need to call out to God to save their soul so they won't spend eternity in a place the Bible calls hell. And if that's you or you're listening online today, call out to God and say, Father, please accept and adopt me, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross, dying for my sin. If you'll do that, the Bible says you become a child of God that very day. Others may need to confess their sins to God and repent and turn away from it. A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite authors, said this. He said, it is our wretched habit of tolerating sin It keeps us in our half-dead condition. I don't know if you remember, David Tozer was active in the Christian Mission Alliance Church back in the late 50s and early 60s, and that's when he wrote and said those kind of things. Things haven't changed a lot. If anything, they've gotten worse. Okay. There are some who may need to return to God and come back to him. And some of us need to be honest before God and claim our responsibility for the mess of that America and the church is in. And I love this picture. People love to say, God bless America, but I think it's more accurate to cross out that B and say, God bless America. That's a better description of the, of the country we live in today, at least of those in charge. We have failed to be true friends to the lost. We have failed to talk to our neighbors and our friends about the Lord. We've lived for ourselves and ignored lost people around us. We talk about sowing seed. We talk about preaching the gospel, but we expect somebody else to do it. We failed to speak up for the poor, the fatherless, and the unborn. And so we live in a land that is no longer a nation of Christians. It is an unchristian, godless nation that celebrates sin and worships self. And what do many Christians do? Someone observed that a lot of Christians just go to church, listen to the sermon, go home, and then turn on the TV. God forgive us. The Bible says in James chapter 4, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. That's called sins of omission. Our country and our communities are in deep trouble. We're in deep trouble economically, culturally, socially, spiritually and the solutions I hear being offered if you look at countries that have tried them only result in more division more poverty more crime more unrest we need to pray and declare our dependence upon almighty God you think about this for years people all over America have been saying God get out of our courts get out of our schools Get out of our communities. Get out of our lives. Well, what if God answered that strange prayer? What if God gets out? What would happen? I mean, if we look back to the founding, we see people who realize they depended on God. What if God does what we want him to do as a country? Have we rejected God as America? I believe it's time to pray like never before. We need to repent of our sins, to fall on our faces and get on our knees and cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive us. Have mercy on us and heal our land. 
I know you've heard this a lot, but 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14 says, If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Folks, if a pandemic doesn't get America to pray like that, I don't know what will. What should we do? The prophet Joel tells us in Joel chapter 2, verse 12, Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. It's up to God's people, I believe, to lead America back to God, to take responsibility for the state of our nation, crying out to God for his forgiveness and mercy, and hoping that in his grace he will Heal our land. So I want to encourage you to pray. Take together. Call, get on the phone. You, you ever pray on the phone with other people? You can. <laughs> to think about how we can get together more and pray before our sovereign creator God for our land, our church, our community, and ourselves. To cry out to God together just like the Christians did in Acts chapter 4. In fact, why don't we just take a couple minutes right now and spend that in prayer, okay? And you say, well, why are you asking, asking us to do it? Because a lot of Christians are just too busy to get together anymore, it seems. To get together and pray. And because we need to pray for forgiveness, we need to pray for God's blessing on our country, on our church, on our community. So can we do that? Can we spend, a couple, spend just a couple minutes together in prayer? Calling out to God, maybe one or two lead out in prayer. And then I'll close in prayer. Can we do that? Do you feel comfortable doing that? Okay, let's do that. Let's just take a couple minutes. And, and I'll just invite a couple of you to lead out in prayer as, as you feel that. Lord, we would just ask you to forgive us for our sins and for a lack of prayer. And we just need a prayer of revival and revival prayer, Lord. Just help us do that and help us. Show us the way, Lord. Show us the way. Heavenly Father, we come today to ask your forgiveness, to seek your blessing and your guidance. 
We know your word says, woe to those who call evil good, but that's exactly what we've done in America. It seems like we've lost our spiritual balance and overturned your truth. Oh God, oh God, search us and know our hearts today. Try us and see if there be some wicked way in us. Cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Please forgive us for our many sins. Please guide our leaders and turn our hearts back to you. Grant us your wisdom. Help us see what we've done to ourselves. Give us understanding to choose the path back to righteousness. And save our children from the godless society that we've given them. Pray, Lord, that you'll guide and bless these men and women who have gathered here today, who have been called by you to bring the gospel of peace to this community. Hear our prayers for mercy. Forgive our sins. Heal our land. Give us your perspective on life and lead us to the center of your will. I ask in the name of your Son, the living Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.